Philippians chapter 4, we'll read verses 4 through 8 for our text. I want to talk to you this morning about fortifying the mind, or an alternative title would be, Get a Grip on Your Mind. Um, Philippians chapter 4, would you stand with me for the reading of the Word of God? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Let's pray. Dear Father, we bow before you. We thank you, Lord, so much for your goodness. We thank you for being here today. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to meet with you among your people here today, for the songs that have been uplifted in God now for your word. I just ask, Lord, for your help, that you'd forgive me, cleanse me, and use me today. Use me to deliver a word that's, that's needed by every one of us, that you could draw every one of us closer, that you might meet a, meet a need that, that we came in here with, and we give you thanks and praise. We also lift up the lost, God, and ask that, uh, that they might be drawn unto Jesus Christ. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As each of us knows, man is a tripartite being. That is, every man is made up of body, soul, every person is made up of body, soul, and spirit. The body allows us to interact with the physical world. The soul allows us to respond uh, to the intellectual and uh, emotional world. The spirit allows us to relate to the spiritual world. Each part of this system is extremely important. Without the body, we would have no contact with the world. Without the soul, we would have no ability to think or feel. Without the spirit, we would have no ability to commune with God. Of course, when we leave this body, the body, excuse me, when we leave this world, the body ceases to be a part of who we are. Even when this body is raised, it'll be in a different manner. It won't be exactly the same. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44. So to be a different form, um, if you're saved, your spirit has already been made alive in Jesus Christ, been sealed until the day of redemption. In other words, the body will drop away and be changed. The spirit's already been changed. What are we left with? The soul. The soul, the mind. The soul could be called the mind. It is the seat of intellect, the seat of will, the seat of emotion. It's where we think, feel, and decide. It's also the place where all of the conflicts that we face in life begin. You see, the mind is the ultimate battlefield. The Lord, the flesh, and the devil are all battling for control of our mind. Why does the battle rage there? The Bible says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. We need to understand that this battle that is raging in the mind is a spiritual battle. Ultimately, it is a battle between good and evil for the control of our lives. Since this is a spiritual battle, we must fight this battle with spiritual resources. Today, I want to use a few minutes to speak to us about the fact that we do not have to lose the battle for our mind. You do not have to be defeated in your walk with the Lord. We do not have to be a slave to worry and fear. We do not have to live our life controlled by lust and desires of the flesh. You can live your life controlled by the Spirit of God. You can win the battle for your mind. So how do we do that, you ask? I'm glad you asked. It doesn't happen automatically. 
you have to take certain steps that will allow it to come to pass. First of all, I want to go to Romans chapter 12. Most of you know where I'm going. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 2, which says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Speaking of the renewing of our mind. And then look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So as we take the step here, particularly in 1 Peter, if we begin taking that step to get a grip on our mind, we put ourselves in position to receive the ministry of the Lord as He renews the mind. The word transform in Romans 12, 2, and the word renewed in Ephesians 4, 23, are both passive voice. They are something to and in the child of God. And then we need to know that we do, uh, um, we do not have to do this alone. In other words, you don't have to tackle this problem all by yourself. We have the Lord's promise in this matter that He'll be there with us, that He'll help us, and that we can win the battle of our mind. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore today, I want us to look into these verses and see how to have victory in the battlefield of the mind. First of all, going back to our text, verse number 4 said, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. So I want to encourage you first of all to build a wall of praise. Praise unto God. Build a wall for your mind of praise. The word rejoice means to be glad. It is uh, an ongoing thing to always be glad in the Lord. To always praise the Lord. We can praise Him no matter what's going on. We can be glad in the Lord for who He is. It don't matter how bad life is coming at us or how much worry and fret might be entering our mind. We can praise the Lord for what He's done. We can praise the Lord for what He's promised to do. We can praise the Lord for His stable, immutable Word that we can always depend on. We have reasons to praise. So build a wall of praise in your mind. Let's face it. Much of life does not lend itself to our happiness. Things happen. Listen, you're not always going to be happy. When Paul penned these words, he was in a Roman prison. But still, Paul knew that regardless of the circumstances of life, God never changes. We can rejoice in that. We can praise Him. That's why he told us to rejoice in the Lord. You see, people change. Circumstances change. Life constantly changes, but the Lord never changes. He is true, He is sure, and we can always have confidence in Him. Since that is true, we can learn to rejoice in who He is, in what He's done, and in what He's promised to do in our lives. Even if the road is hard, remember that He's planned your path. Psalm 37, 23 said, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So whatever you're facing, though it might surprise you, and you didn't expect it, it didn't surprise God. If He led you into it, He'll lead you through it, over it, around it, below it. Somehow, He'll see that you've come through it, having learned a great lesson from it, and uh, are strengthened by it. And He can receive glory and honor. And by the way, that's our whole purpose, isn't it? His glory and His honor. Not ours, 
His glory and His honor. He's promised to make all things work together for good, hadn't He? Romans 8, 28. He's promised to go uh, uh, with us through the hardships of life. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's promised you abiding victory. In Him, we can have victory. He's promised us that the destination will be worth the trip. You ever loaded up your family and started to go somewhere and you didn't get very far, the kids started hollering over there yet? <laughs> yep. Sometimes I feel like that. God, I'm ready. Is it time yet? God, I'm ready. Will you come back in the morning? <laughs> I'm so ready. But his timing is perfect. And when his time's right, he's going to step out on the cloud and he's going to call our name and we're going to go up. He's going to say something like, come up hither. I don't know if he'll say that exactly. But when he does, gravity's going to lose his hope. We're going, we'll be changed. We'll meet him in the air and, and we'll live forever be with the Lord. And the trip of uh, the destination will be worth the trip, my friends. Even when you cannot be happy about your life, we need to learn to be happy in the Lord. We need to learn to rejoice in the Lord. So build a wall of praise, first of all, to guard your mind. Secondly, build a wall of patience. The word moderation. Verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The word moderation literally means gentle or gracious spirit. It has the idea of being patient with others, of giving way to the rights and wishes of others. It does not mean compromise doctrine now. It don't mean compromise the truth. That's not what it's saying. But it does mean that you have a willingness to take the back seat in favor of the other person or in favor of other people. This is the idea of Philippians 2, 4 that led us into the last two weeks of study about Christ. Paul's saying that the reality of our faith should be demonstrated by how we deal with others. If the focus of our lives is on ourselves, then when people hurt us, slight us, and cross us, there'll be a desire to retaliate and get vengeance. There'll be a desire to lash out. Paul wants us to get the focus off ourselves and get it on others. When we're focused on those around us, we'll be less likely to be hurt by what others do and say. We'll be more likely to give the benefit of the doubt rather than take the, take the hurts. What they say won't sting as bad, in other words. How they act can be passed over more easily. When we adopt a mentality of self-love, we'll always look at things and people as a personal attack. They're attacking me. No. Sometimes I disagree with you. Don't mean I'm attacking you. Don't mean I quit loving you. Sometimes you disagree with me. Don't mean you quit loving me. Don't mean we're attacking one another. It will cause us to wear our feelings. When we have a mentality of self-love, it will cause us to wear our feelings on our sleeve and be more easily hurt by the words and actions of others. This will cause us problems. It will cause us problems in the mind as we dwell on what was done or said. If we can learn to love others, it will protect the mind from dwelling on negative things. It'll build a wall of protection around the mind that others cannot penetrate. The bottom line is this. If we can learn to live in genuine contentment, then it'll not matter what anyone else says or does. I used to tell my son this. It's good for all of us. You know who you are. You be confident in who you are. And it don't matter what others think. It don't matter what others say. 
when you're always trying to please others and, 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 and change to meet their standards, then you'll never please anybody. But if you're confident in who you are before God, it don't matter what they say or think. You can live your life in perfect contentment. The mind will be protected from the evil it likes to find in others. The devil loves nothing better than to get your eyes off Jesus and on the faults of others. The flesh loves nothing better than to go along with the devil in this matter. When this happens, the mind is in danger. Number three, build a wall of prayer. We're building a wall of praise. We build a wall of patience. Now we're building a wall of prayer. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we're warned here against the dangers of worry in verse 6. The word careful has the idea of anxiety. It refers to the state of mind that is agitated over the events and circumstances of life. Now there's nothing wrong with having concern. We all have concerns and there's nothing wrong with having concern. We take those concerns to God and we pray about them and we turn them over to Him and we don't have to be worrif uh, worrisome and fretful and burdened. We all have our concerns about things. It's when our concerns have us that there's a problem. When our concerns control our mind, there's a problem. Worry is so dangerous because it allows the mind to conceive false notions about God. Worry is so dangerous because the mind begins to question God. Is God looking? Does God know? Is God aware? Does God care? All those things go through our mind when we're consumed with worry. Well, I want to tell you something. God is real, and He does care. Hebrews, for example, chapter 7, chapter 4. When the problems of life come our way, we're given some precious help in, for example, Hebrews 13. The Lord is near. Not just in His second coming, but He's always near to His children. Exercise the tool of prayer. Paul speaks of prayer, supplications, and requests. These might be thought of as general prayer, specific prayer, and detailed prayer. The main thrust of this verse is that instead of worrying, the believer is to demonstrate his faith in the power and will of God by seeking the Lord in prayer. There are times that we can pray very generally. When somebody says, pray for me, but don't tell me anything more than that. Listen, I call his name or her name before the Lord. God, you know, and I don't know, and they didn't want me to know, but you know. And there's other times when people come to me and say, pray for me about this. And I name that specific thing. God, you know they're struggling in this area. And help. And there's sometimes they go into more explanation and give details. That's when I can pray detailed prayers in that, in that situation. But all of it, the, the fact is, God knows all of it. We need to develop a thankful heart. Regardless of the situation you face in life, learn to praise the Lord through all of them. Nothing brings him nearer or drives the devil away faster than a genuinely thankful heart. The Lord's promise to us is that he will replace our worries with his, with his peace. When we come before him trusting in humble prayer. The word keep in verse 7 means to garrison, to build a fort around, to post a guard. So the Lord promises to post a guard around the heart and mind of the person who trusts Him 
for the needs of life. Instead of worrying yourself sick about things you cannot change, and by the way, if you can change it, then just get to it. Change it. But if it's something you cannot change, instead of worrying yourself sick about it, learn to turn it over to the Lord, let Him have it, and move forward trusting in Him. Build a wall of prayer. And then... Verse number 8, build a wall of purity. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. All of these words are a picture for us of the Word of God. Godly thoughts. Thoughts that lend us toward godliness. The Word of God is true. Whatsoever things are true, the Word of God is true. Since the Bible is true, everything it says fits within the categories mentioned by Paul. It's honest. Honorable. It is just. It's right. It is pure, it's holy and clean. It is lovely, it's beautiful. It is of good report, good reputation. It is full of virtue, excellence. It is full of praise, that which tends to, uh, toward worship, to, to guide us into worship. Be careful what you let into your mind. Through music, through television, through movies, through Acquaintances, books, acquaintances, be careful what you let into your mind. Take in the Word of God and you can be renewed and your life transformed. What we have here is a call to fix our minds upon the things of God. The source for finding out about the things in the Word of God. In other words, if we fill our minds with the words of God, There'll be no room for evil. There'll be no room for worry. There'll be no room for fear. There'll be no room for vengeance. There'll be no room for confusion. There'll be no room for lust. There'll be no room for trouble. A mind filled with and led by the Word of God is a stable mind. Get a grip on your mind. If you want a stable, fixed mind, the only place to get it is the Word of God. We're to take the initiative and force the mind to dwell on biblical things, on what the Bible says, instead of allowing the mind to run to evil. Gossip. What others are doing. Problems. A mind saturated with and fixed upon the Word of God is a stable mind. It's something that you must do for yourself. You've got the purpose in your heart to fix your mind upon the Word of God. We wonder why we don't get much out of preaching sometimes when we come to church. The answer lies in the fact that every day we allow our minds to be fed with filth. Filth of the world. To dwell upon the problems that are going on. To dwell upon problem people of life if we would give as much energy to dwelling upon the word of God day by day it would transform our time in the Lord's house it would transform our time spent together fellowshipping in the word of God your mind is a precious gift from God it can be used for good or for evil. And all the forces of good and evil are battling for control of your mind. Who wins the battle is always determined by you. Us, individually. No one can control your mind but you. We're told in the Bible 
that we need to fortify the mind. It's our job individually. And it cannot be passed off to others. This is a very critical matter because how you think determines how you'll live. Proverb, I want to close with a couple verses. And one comes from Proverbs 4 and 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And then we're to see that we set our minds on the love of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Until the mind is settled, all of life will be out of control. One last verse. I just know I could quote it, but I'm going to read it. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Settle your mind. Get a grip on your mind today, always, every day. Let's bow. Dear Father, we bow before you. We thank you again for your word, for your word, God, that tells us how that we can have a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, that we can commune with you. That's a spiritual part. How that we can properly interact, God, with fellow man, and how we can properly interact, God, with the things we face in life. That's the soul part. God, help us to get a grip on the mind. And then, God, help us to use the body properly, too. That's the physical part. Father, I just ask that you help all of us to fortify our mind to spend more time in your word and then to live out what you teach us in your word for those around us sake that they might see the reality of Jesus Christ and come to know him as Savior. God, we give you all thanks and praise and credit and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.